quote, it remains to be seen as the current presidential campaign unfolds whether Americans are willing to consider what the flight from reason has cost us as a people and whether any candidate has the will or the courage to talk about ignorance as a political issue affecting everything from scientific research to decisions about war and peace. The Age of American Unreason offers an unsparing description of what Susan Jacoby calls an overarching crisis of memory and knowledge. Susan Jacoby is the program director of the Center for Inquiry in New York. In an age of unreason, you tend to get focus on very small personal facts as opposed to big issues. But even more than that, lack of knowledge and unreason affects the way candidates speak about everything. I mean, for example, obviously the health care situation in this country is very important. All of the candidates say it is. But if people don't know, for example, how is health care handled in other countries? Uh, how many people, for instance, do have the right to choose their own doctors in this country? In other words, without a base of knowledge of, of how things are, you can't really have a reasonable talk about how things ought to be. You have a, a powerful section in here on what's happened to our political language. How, for example, politicians so often talk these days not about people, but folks. about folks, about folks. the folks. Uh, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with it is folks used to be a colloquialism. Well, but think about this, though. Think about our political language in the past and today. Just think about the Gettysburg Address. We highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this government of the folks, by the folks, and for the folks shall not perish from the earth. This is, this is patronizing. It's talking down to people. I read all of FDR's fireside chats where he, I could not find a single reference to folks. When you call people citizens, you're calling them to rise, calling on them to rise above. And people are terribly scared of, of saying we really need to expect more. You mentioned Franklin Roosevelt. You have a wonderful comparison when he, when he would have a radio uh, fireside chat. He would ask the American people listening out there to get a map of the world and spread it out in front of them so that as he talked about the battles that were going on, they would be with him in terms of the place, the geography, the, the strategy of what was going on. Can you imagine a president doing that today? No, no, I can't. I mean, Doris Kearns Goodwin, you know, talks about this extensively in her book, No Ordinary Time. Maps sold out. You couldn't buy a map before Roosevelt's fireside chat in the February after Pearl Harbor because millions of Americans went out and bought maps and they sat there by the radio and followed what he was talking about. But I think, you know, one of the big mistakes today that's made today is it, where you talk about our political culture as if it were something separate, something different from our general culture. What I say in the age of American unreason is, no, that's wrong. Our political culture is a reflection of our general culture. Uh, it, is, it is as much shaped by our general culture as it shapes our general culture. What's far more important than being a commander-in-chief is being an educator-in-chief. And Franklin Roosevelt and Abraham Lincoln would not have succeeded as commanders-in-chief if they hadn't first succeeded as teachers-in-chief. To be nonpartisan about it, Bill Clinton and George W. Bush are two of the biggest failures as teachers-in-chief of any presidents we've ever had. Bush at foreign policy, obviously. It's great to bring people along with you when everybody's in favor of a war as they were in 2003 because there was this desire to strike back at somebody, anyone, for 9-11. So Bush just said, oh yeah, Saddam Hussein had something to do with 9-11 and people believed it. Uh, but And Clinton? What about Clinton? Everything, in my view, that's being written about the failure of the Clinton health care program in relation to Hillary Clinton's candidacy is wrong. Uh, yes, it's true. It's th that failure is usually attributed to their failure to bring the insurance industry groups to the table, all of the interest groups in advance. Uh, no. The reason that health care reform was dead on arrival was that the American people hadn't been educated and prepared for any kind of change. Uh, Bill Clinton just announced his plan, which had been developed kind of secretly without much public participation. The health insurance industry jumped in with its Harry and Louise commercials. Now, it is the job of the president to get his message out before Harry and Louise. Bill Clinton didn't do that after Freethinkers was published. I really welcomed the opportunity to go out and speak across the country, you know, to educate people about a secular tradition which has been kind of lost and downgraded and denigrated. And I soon found very quickly that my audiences consisted 
almost entirely of people who already agreed with me. Yes. And conservatives report exactly the same yeah. experience. Now, this was not always the case in our country. Uh, in the 19th century, Robert Ingersoll, who was known as the great agnostic, had audiences full of people who didn't agree with him. But they wanted to hear what he had to say. And they wanted to see whether the devil really has horns. Uh, and now what we have is a situation in which people go to hear people they already agree with. What's going on is not so much education, as reinforcement of the opinions you already have. Yeah, why is it we're so unwilling to give, as you say, a hearing to contradictory viewpoints, or to imagine that we might learn something from someone who disagrees with us? I think part of it is, is part of a larger thing that is making our culture dumber. We have really over the past 40 years gotten shorter and shorter and shorter attention spans. One of the most important studies I found and I put in this chapter, they call it infotainment uh, on this book, was by the Kaiser Family Foundation. And they found that children under six spend two hours a day watching television and video, an average, but only 39 minutes a day being read to by their parents. Well, it doesn't, you don't need a scientific study to know that if you're not read to by your parents, if most of your entertainment when you're in those very formative years is looking at a screen, you value what you do. And I don't see how people can learn to concentrate and read if, if, if they watch television when they're very young, uh, as opposed to having their parents read to them. What does it say to you that nearly two-thirds, two-thirds of Americans want creationism based on the book of Genesis to be taught in our public schools along with evolution. What does that say? Well, you? the idea that, that, that evolution is just a theory. It's just another opinion. Just as some people believe that the account of the six days of creation in Genesis is literally true, some people believe we're descended from lower animals. In other words, it places belief on the same level as science subject to proof. I should say, however, that it may also mean that a lot of Americans aren't exactly sure what creationism means. Because, in fact, the most recent Gallup poll shows that only 30% of Americans believe that every word of the Bible is literally true. In other words, many, most Americans believe the Bible is divinely inspired. But you can believe the Bible is divinely inspired and still believe in right. evolution. There, there's a, there was a wonderful book on religious literacy by Stephen Prothero, you know, which cites a poll that half of Americans can't name Genesis as the first book of the Bible. It's sort of like, you know, I don't know what Genesis is, but I believe it. Doesn't this say also say something beyond religious belief about the level of science education in our public schools? I think it says everything about the level of education in our schools. Uh, when you have, look, one out of every five Americans still believes that the, uh, that the sun revolves around the earth. But you shouldn't have to be an intellectual or a college graduate to know that the sun doesn't revolve around the earth. There's been a huge failure of education. Uh, I think it's gotten worse uh, in this way. I, I do agree with many cultural conservatives about this. They really have placed less emphasis on the overall culture, uh, cultural things that everybody should know. Talk about the power and importance of memory. Memory. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, uh, one of the things that, that we don't remember is what our Constitution actually says. Uh, uh, one of the things we don't remember is uh, uh, right, right now, even as we sit here, uh, the Bush administration is trying to claim that it has the right without congressional approval to make permanent agreements for military in our military involvement in Iraq. Constitution says these things need to be ratified by Congress, as were the treaties that you and I grew up with, the NATO treaty, for example, it was ratified by Congress. Uh, if we don't know what our Constitution says about the separation of powers, then it really, it really certainly affects the way we decide all kinds of public issues. For example, what the right wing says about judges is uh, our unelected judges are overstepping their powers. Uh, they, they, they talk as if uh, judges, judges have no right to interpret the Constitution, but that is what the unelected federal judiciary exactly was set up to do. It says so in the Constitution. But if you don't know, how can, oh, yeah, we don't, in other words, people confuse the fact that they may not like certain judicial decisions with the right of judges to interpret the Constitution, indeed, the duty of judges under our Constitution to interpret the Constitution.